I think I'm live. Hello, language facilitators. Welcome back to another episode of language facilitation information and Q&A here on my Waves of Communication YouTube channel and the Language Facilitation Helpline podcast. So I'm so happy you're here with me. Um, I hope that the topic today is interesting to you. Here it is. I'm going to be talking about late talking and virtual autism. So I've got for you today five signs that your child's um, symptoms, we're going to talk about them, are caused by virtual autism. And then, of course, as always, I have remedies or strategies for you to use to change your situation. That's why you're here. I equip and empower parents of late talkers. My name is Marcy Melzer. If you don't know me, I'm an intuitive speech language pathologist and language facilitation coach and consultant. And that's what I do on my website, wavesofcommunication.com. You can head over there to observe, learn, check out all of the resources that I have, books and trainings and videos and testimonials and all kinds of information over there for parents. So, but I know today you're here because you're interested in this virtual autism situation. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to talk about what virtual autism is. And I have a slide for you. Um, these, this was taken off the Internet. I know that you'll be able to go and Google and read more about it, but I know it's very common. It's so common that this guy, a clinical psychologist from Romania, was seeing it so much in the children's hospital that he did a study. So virtual autism refers to autistic-like symptoms that children develop after excessive screen exposure. It was coined by this Romanian clinical psychologist who investigated the rise in autism cases, sharp autism rise that we all are seeing. And what we know is virtual autism is not the same as autism spectrum disorder. And some pediatricians claim, including this guy from Romania and other people, not just pediatricians, claim that virtual autism can be reversed by stopping screen exposure and increasing face-to-face -face interaction. And then there's little, um, you can see those little markings there to let you know that that's where you can read those complete articles to learn more about what virtual autism is. I know that you're here because you see the symptoms, the reality of your child's situation and you're potentially wondering, it, it probably did in many of your cases, most of your cases, receive the actual autism spectrum disorder diagnosis because your children are displaying these symptoms and let's talk about what they are because they are the same. Remember, just like we saw in that previous slide, virtual autism mimics the symptoms of autism spectrum disorder. So all of these symptoms are characteristics of both autism spectrum disorder and virtual autism. So let's talk about what they are. We're just going to read through them here. Late talking, not responding when they're called, resistance to cooperation or cooperative learning. They won't let you help them do things. They won't let you um, show them how to do things. They are also super hyper independent. Um, poor muscle coordination. That's common in both of these things. You wouldn't think about it, but it is. Anxiety and irritability are common symptoms, scripted repetitive speech, addicted to all screens. Whatever screen they see, they want to investigate it. They um, have repeated behaviors. They watch the same bits on screen over and over and over again. Um, they have odd speech patterns and voices. They may have, remember, these are symptoms. Not every child has every symptom, but these are the symptoms that are spotted in both. Poor attention to structure is happening. They're unable to play with toys. They don't know how to play. They're afraid of social situations, or at least they um, avoid them. They might be obsessed with a specific 
topics. So whatever they're watching on the screen or whatever they want to talk about all the time is always the same thing. They could be increasing in their nonverbal behavior because, of course, they are late talking. And the older they get, the more the nonverbal behavior increases because the late talkers don't have another language. So that's what they're using. And the meltdowns come out of nowhere for both of these and they refuse to try new things. So you can see that these are the symptoms. They might not be what's listed on every red flag checklist that you see on the autism spectrum. But in my experience, because I have had thousands of parents present to me their case, their cases. My child is, of course, not talking because I'm a speech pathologist. They're going to come to see me. And they are also doing these other behaviors, these other symptoms. So, um, and it's not just lining up toys or flapping their hands or holding their ears. These are real functional things that are going on in the child's life. That's why most parents are concerned about these symptoms because they're going on in your life. Let's take a look again at how these things, these symptoms disrupt your life. If they're not responsible, when they're called, if they have anxiety, if they're avoiding social situations, if they're meltdowns out of nowhere, if they refuse to try any new things, you could have been, you know, as a parent or caregiver, trying really hard to get this child off of the tech and into your world and into having more screen, you know, less screen time and more face-to-face -face time. But this kid is so stuck in their virtual autism that they won't let, they're stuck. This is why we have waves of communication because Parents are in this position where the children are being stuck. They're feeling stuck in their nonverbal communication because of their addiction to screens. So let's talk about the five signs that this is virtual autism and not something else that's going on. Here are five signs that you can use right now. And then we're going to talk about a little test. After I show you these signs, I've got a little test for you to use to see if your child has virtual autism. And then we'll talk about how to use what you do know about your child instead of having to rely on someone else to decide if your child has virtual autism. We're going to talk about how you can use what you know about your late talk in your life to help them make the shift out of tech addiction into more face-to-face -face time where they will develop their spoken language. That's the whole point here. So let's talk about those five signs right now. Here they are, one, one slide. Five signs of virtual autism. Number one, the child initiates communication to help you guess all of their messages. All of their messages are not surrounding tech. How do you know when the child is hungry? Are you always just showing up with food or are they coming to you to tell you that they want it? Are they coming to you to show you when something is broken and they need you to fix it or something is locked and they want you to open it or something is not happening fast enough and they want it to happen faster or good enough or hot enough or cold enough or, you know, whatever. If you are getting that child initiating, meaning they are coming to you to tell you all of these messages, ideas, opinions. They're instructing you in how they want you to do things exactly the way they want it. All of that is a sign that your child has a virtual form of autism and not a true autism because these, this is the primary difference between a true autism and a late talking is initiation. Kids with true autism will not come to you. They will stay by themselves in their misery. They won't want you to come and join them in their happiness or their misery because 
This is what late talkers do. They come to you to get you into their own mind and their own world and their own feelings so that you will feel what they're feeling and help them feel better. You will help them. You will initiate helping them. They're coming to you to ask you for assistance and you are understanding or responding to those things. You're guessing. They're initiating. You are guessing. This is the number one sign that it is virtual, virtual autism. Okay? I'm not seeing any comments, but if you have any comments or questions, you're welcome to put them down in the description box. Okay, let's look at the next sign. Sign number two is your child will forget about screens. When they are socially and physically active. So once again, when they are jumping on the bed or they are, that's what I think about Aaron, when they're jumping on the bed, when they're taking you out for a walk, when they're swinging on the swing, when they are, um, you know, doing something physical or they are wanting to be social. They want cuddles. They want you to kiss their boo-boo because they got to hurt. They want you to um, respond to their meltdown. You know, they, they want you to come and help them. Remember, this is initiating. When they're doing these things, that's how you know that it's not true autism, okay? So they'll forget about screens while, they're in, while they are initiating, while they're doing other things. They will leave the screen. Okay, so this is a child who is hooked on screens, but able to give them up, right? Do you see the difference between a virtual autism and a child that's truly stuck on screens because it's the only way they can learn, which is more like an autism profile? All right, number three here. Child will ask for screens when they can't access them, access them independently, so once again, they're coming to you. They're bringing you the remote. They're bringing you the charger. They're bringing you, they're trying to get your phone out of your hand, right? If they can get it independently, they'll go. They'll get it in the purse. They'll get it from the charger. They'll get it from whatever. But when they can't access it, this is the difference between a kid with autism and a kid who has virtual autism. The kid with virtual autism will come to you. They will come, they will try on their own, but then they will come to you. The child with true autism, they won't come to you. They'll just keep trying on their own. In fact, they'll wreck stuff. They'll destroy things. They'll, they'll push down a whole cabinet to get that, that device but a kid with virtual autism will come to you. They will come to you to ask them for it. They will bring things. They will show you. They will take you to that device and have you take it down for them. A child with autism won't do that. So that's a big, big difference between the virtual autism and the true autism, okay? And then here's the next one. The child will give up screen time independently for interesting alternatives. So it's not like they never like something else. It's similar to that other one. If they, if something you're doing, baking a cake, their favorite cake, or you're going to their favorite place, or their favorite new friend is coming over, auntie, uncle, their, their teacher, their therapist, their school time, their something, somebody else, even if it's not you, somebody else is able to get that child to have a great time with no screens involved, zero screens involved. And that child chooses to go and spend time with that person or activity. It's usually a cooperative activity I'm talking about. That's why it's when uncle so-and-so comes over, we go bike riding. Or when auntie so-and-so comes over, we always make that special cake. Or when we go to the mall, I get to eat my favorite ice cream or get my favorite lollipop. Or when we go to the park, I get to go on my favorite big slide. Slide, right? These are times when the kids aren't thinking about screens at all because there are other things and people and experiences in their life that are more 
important to them. Why? Because those are interactive experiences. They just don't have enough of those things to compete with the love of the screen that they have. This is what's going on. And that's how you can tell that it's a virtual situation. Right. And then here's number five is that the child asks for screens for the same time of day or the same activity or the same habit that they always, always do. So that means that they are whenever they eat, they won't eat without the tablet. They won't potty without the tablet. They won't fill in the blank, ride in the car, get dressed, let you take them to whatever without a device. These are the the tr characteristics that you know oops sorry you <laughs> hear my my grand dog in the background there he's uh barking at the dogs that are in the neighborhood so sorry about that if you hear that in the background but um anyway back to these five signs i'm going to show you one more time this slide to review remember if your child is initiating communication if they if they will forget about screens if they will ask for screens when they can't access them on their own if they will give screen up time up independently or if they will ask for screens at the same time of day for the ac activity out of habit okay so those are the first five signs that virtual autism, that's virtual autism and not autism. But here is how you know for sure is that you do a little test and this test is not something you do with your child. This is your evaluating and analyzing <clears throat> your own experiences as the parent and caregiver of this late talking child that you want to analyze. Let's go for the test. Okay, <clears throat> have a little drink here. So the short test for virtual autism is number one here. When does the child come to you to make a specific nonverbal request? When did they do it today? When have they done it regularly? What requests do they always come? What are they always asking you for? That's not the phone, or maybe it might be the phone, but when do they come to you and they tell you exactly how they want you to deliver that request? They want, they tell you exactly the way they want you to deliver it, okay? When does that happen? Because if that's happening, then you know. Number two here, what is your child always willing to go out and do or explore or play, whether there's tablets involved or not. If you say, let's go to the park, let's go to X, Y, Z. What is it about your child that they're always willing to go and do explore play? That's not a tablet. This is the next one. What does your child request? How, excuse me, how does your child request screen time? What are they doing? What kind of communication are they using? Are they even coming to request screen time or do they always get it on their own or is it always available on their own? If you look at this little boy here, he's got three devices he's trying to navigate because he independently found these things. And it's not the same as indicating whatever. He's just trying to manipulate these objects, right? How does your child request the screen time that they want to manipulate? when they're confused, when they can't figure it out, right? When does your child forget about needing their videos? What, what, what are the times that has happened in the past week that you were like, look what he's doing. He's not holding a screen. He's not holding the phone. He doesn't even need the phone. When did you notice that your child didn't need their videos? And then here's the next one. What does your child refuse to do without a screen to look at. So first of all, think about when did they, when did they forget about it? When did you watch them forget about it? And also when does your child refuse to do anything without a screen? Because when is it just a habit, right? What, how has the habit been developed? When is the habit, right? Because that's how you're gonna work with these things in the future. And then look at this. How does your child find screen time when you try to limit it? What are they doing? to try to find it when you try to limit it. This is your test, okay? Now, the answers to those, te those test items, those questions are, that you're gonna ask yourself about your experiences are your proof that number one, 
your child is in a virtual situation. Let's not even call it autism. They're late talking because of a virtual situation. It's not a physical situation. It's created out of reality, created a virtual reality. It's not reality. It's virtual, created out of habits and patterns that were programmed, either self-programmed by the child with these devices or even by the people who gave them these devices, right? Because how did they access these devices from less than one year old? If you Gave your child access to screens. It doesn't even have to be a handheld device. Could be the television. For more than one or two hours every day since before they were 12 months old. They were babies. And they spent a big chunk of their learning time in front of a screen. It is highly likely that your child's autism symptoms, those symptoms from the first page, are caused by a virtual situation that has been created out of screen time. That virtual situation looks different for every family. That's why there are literal, I saw on the internet as I was doing research for this video for you, you can pay $850 and send videos for someone to tell them whether your child is truly autistic or virtually autistic. And that's what I do with language facilitation. But the reality is what you need is what do I do with this information? Now that I realized maybe I contributed to, because you did, you allowed this access of this phone. You encouraged it maybe even in some cases. So because you were there contributing to the current situation, what can you do to get out of it? And that's what we're going to talk about next. Now that you know that this, these symptoms, these situations that we're going to call symptoms are a result of a virtual situation, what can you do? Here's what you do. You use the abilities you use the abilities of the child that you have observed, that you just tested for with those last questions to replace screen time with the one-on-one, -on -one, face to face human engagement interaction that is necessary for those symptoms to go away, okay? So here is what we're gonna talk about. Number one here is the child initiates communication. When they initiate communication of any kind with you, you need to respond to nonverbal communication with valuable speech models. Valuable speech models are not the same as what's on the videos. They are bigger, better, more functional, and here's the kicker, more applicable to that individual child's individual life because they are picking up that phone and they are adept at scrolling exactly to the video they want, exactly the part of the video that they want, exactly the, the, the 20 seconds of the kids yelling or the, the guy falling down, the visual component, the auditory component, whatever it is that they are hooked on, they know how to find it immediately. And so when they want you to help them get into that situation with the videos, you use it to provide valuable information that's going to help them access those videos. But you need to do that with everything in your life. So when the child comes to you to tell you they're hungry, you have to give them valuable spoken language around that hunger situation, around their fearful situation, around the social situation, around the school situation, around the writing, the reading, the hugging auntie, the blow the candles, the holding their ears, the whatever of those other symptoms that you want to focus on, that's where you start by providing the valuable speech 
models that this child can learn from to drop the stuff that they need and pick up what they do. You know, what they're getting from the phone, that 20 seconds of whatever is the same old stuff, same old stuff, same old stuff, same old stuff. When you do the same old stuff, like, um, oh, look, you're watching the phone. You want phone again. Oh, you're watching Barney or you're watching Cocomelon or you're watching ABC Rhymes or you want the Itsy Bitsy Spider song or whatever. You're just saying more of the same, 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 same. Remember, the kids are going back to get these same things because they're stuck in their comfort zone of sameness. They know what th this is and that's why they can go get it. They know what it is. They can know exactly what to expect from it. They know how to access it. So they're going to go and they're going to access it. And they're going to tell you, you're going to see how they are communicating. I want this. I want that. I want it this way. I want the blue cup. I want the hot water. You know what these things are. And that's why you have to give the child valuable communication whenever they communicate about everything. You can't chase them around and say, oh, you're playing with trains. I'm going to teach you about trains. When they communicate to you, you must respond to their communication with more language than they're getting from the phone and tablet. That's how you prove that you are more interesting and more valuable because they know all they're going to get from the phone is the same, 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 same. And when they talk to you as a connected, intuitive language facilitator, you're going to give them more. You're going to give them more interesting, more attractive, more personal, more functional, more real talking that's going to replace the same old, same old, same old. Think about yourself. After you watch a whole video series on Netflix, are you going to go back and watch the same thing over and over and over again? Only the episode that really made you laugh or really made you cry or really made you whatever. And if you are stuck in the same, watching the same movies over and over and over and over again, what does that do to your mindset about watching a new thing? Hey, I got this new show. No, 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 thank you. I don't want to learn anything new. I don't want to see anything new. I'm stuck in this. I like this. I'm watching the same reruns of, of Gilmore Girls and whatever for the eighth time. How do you think kids pick up these habits, you guys? What kind of influence are you giving them? When you give them more valuable speech models than they're getting from the tech, they will drop the tech and focus on you. So that's the number one thing is that you have to respond to nonverbal communication. All right. The number two here is the child will forget about screens when they're socially or physically active. So guess what? Schedule more interactive, cooperative, active. That's the interactive part. Schedule this time every day and record it with video. Make, get your phone out. Have somebody else record you. Record selfies with the child while you're doing these interactive times. Get moving. Film it. Start talking. And if you're giving more, right, here's the key, right? If you are giving more valuable spoken language during those interactive activities that you plan. Remember, we're not chasing after the child. That's the tip number one. You have to respond to their communication, of course. But how do you get them out of the comfort zone? You introduce new ideas that they're going to love. How do you know they love them? Because they'll give up phones to do them on their own. So you bridge, right? You always introduce things that you know your child's going to love because they love it more than their thing that they're addicted to. OK, and why do they love it more? Because they don't know how limiting these devices are. They don't know. They just know they feel good when they're jumping and they're not thinking. Remember, they're forgetting about the phone because they're doing other things that are more interesting and appropriate. And that's the idea. You just want to get that time down, 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 down that they're on the device and up, 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 up that they're interactive. So. That requires you as the parent and caregiver to schedule this time, plan this time, and do this time maybe even multiple times in a day, depending on how stuck your child is. If you're not planning interactive activities that are more attractive, full of more language than these devices, your child's always going to choose the device. They're, 
It's just common sense. Think about your own experience. You got somebody who wants to come over who's boring and has the same old stories over and over again, you know, your grandpa or your uncle or whatever, and you would rather be watching a rerun of the Gilmore Girls or the Kardashians or Below Deck or whatever you're watching, junk TV, because we all do. We all have it to get out of our lives. If you would rather watch junk TV that you've already seen, that you already know is going to happen, instead of interacting with people, your lay talker will do the same, okay? So it's all about that choice of being at least as beautiful and interactive as these things can be. All right, let's look at the next one. The child will ask for screens. So the reason they're asking is the same reason you choose screens. They're bored, they're lonely, they're waiting and filling time, or they just want something more entertaining than what they have around them. They're, they're, they're limited in their options. They don't have anything else to do. Like they're bored because they don't know what else to do. So they go to the videos to look for some new ideas of entertainment. They're asking for screens for these things. So you just offer alternatives, real, physical, interactive alternatives for boredom, loneliness, waiting, and entertainment. These are the primary reason the children get them and get addicted to them because they don't know how to find alternative solutions on their own. So they resort to what they do know, which is the phone. And remember, you gave them this phone and carte blanche to explore learning in other languages and all that other stuff. So that's the thing. Remember, you have to understand that if your child is resistant to anything and the only thing they want when they're bored or um, they want entertainment or they, they, the only place they know to seek new ideas is in their device. That's a habit that you can fix by continually offering doing the previous thing. Once you start scheduling everyday time that is not phone related, your child will start looking forward to that fun, interactive time. Just like you look forward to a visit from a super fun friend who has great ideas, who comes over and tells jokes and makes you laugh every time. You'll never put the TV on when that person's visiting you. So that's what you want to do is you want to be the visitor who's going to be entertaining and time filling and interesting and a little educational and help them solve problems and all those other things. If you are that person, they will quit the phones for you because it's more valuable to them. Okay. Now, if the child will give up screen time independently, then, you know, because they will, like you've, maybe you've worked through, we can only have this much time with screens. Like you, as soon as you have two minutes of screens, then you give them up to do whatever, right? And so if you have a child who's that far advanced in their screen time use, maybe you've already been using, you've watched my swapping tech nine for talk time challenge. You've limited screen time. Excuse me. I have a little drink. Just want to remind you, I guess that's why I'm coughing a little as we've got big allergies in Florida going on right now. And you are the best spoken language facilitator, you as parents and caregivers. So and tea is the best for allergy voice. So back to it really understanding how important it is that you need to demonstrate up front. Your child's not going to automatically choose you over their favorite technology, but they will start to choose you more often than their favorite technology if you prove to them on a consistent, meaning everyday basis, that you are every day more interested, that when they're bored, you show up with an idea. When they need entertainment, you show up with some new fun thing to look at. When they need some support, you show up with education. Because remember, why do you go to the YouTube? Why do you turn to the internet? Why do you turn to the screen instead of people? You feel like there's no one around that'll help me. No one will talk to me. No one will be my friend. No one will hang out with me. That's why you go to your phone, 
right? Now, if you don't want people to hang out with you and you don't want social interaction, that's when maybe some phone time is okay to schedule in your day. But how much is it compared to the time that you spend interacting. This is where we have a problem. I'm not saying that you need to stop phones completely because they're super valuable and we all use them, but we all use them too much. We all do. And those of us who are already talking, we know how to put it down and turn our speech back on. But a late talker does not know how. They don't know how to talk when they put it down. They haven't learned yet. They are late talking. So you don't realize how easy it is for you to put down this tech and go for a walk or whatever until you just feel like I can't. I can't do it. I, and then you start making excuses, right? Uh, it's too late. It's too hot. I My hip hurts. I have things to do in the house, right? And then you start to do the dishes and put the phone on instead of interacting with your child to do the dishes, okay? This is how these things start and how they perpetuate is through your own modeling and your own situation. Let's look again at these things you can do. Now, the child asks for screens for the same activities over and over and over again. And that's, it, this is a no-brainer. You just make those activities more attractive, interactive, right? We're back to an interactive situation and fun. Why do you choose to eat by yourself, right? Maybe, here's another throw your thing out there. Those activities that the child wants the phone for are things that previously have been high pressure activities. You have to eat on my, what, uh, what I want you to eat on my schedule, sitting at the table. You have to do this thing on my, you have to talk when I ask. You have to answer questions I'm asking you. I want you to perform. Even if you said, mama, I want to hear you say mama again because it makes me feel good. Like all those are the habits and patterns that cause kids to want to shut people off and put their attention on tech. And they use it as a distractor. So like, okay, I'll eat this terrible food as long as I don't think about it, or I'll let you literally physically put my clothes on my body instead of teaching me how to do it myself. If you insist on putting your hands all over the child and making them do things instead of teaching them and empowering their independence, like the last trick that I had for you, then your kids are going to start to resent and avoid this interaction. And how they do it is literally virtually by holding a screen while you're pulling down their pants and changing their clothes and doing that stuff it's for them to go to the bathroom, for them to do whatever. They're not even participating in the activity because you've taken away that responsibility to participate in their own activity by letting them have a phone while you do it, right? So you have to detach from the phone for these activities and make them more fun. It's the only way that you'll be able to get the child to decrease it. And if you want to know how to do all of these things, that's when training and support comes into play. Like if you can't figure out, there's people who are working with me for a long time. As a matter of fact, here is a comment. So from Isaiah who says, this is my child. Since doing the research, it definitely lines up right now that you see that your child has been labeled with something that they don't have. You've already got the label. You've already got it. You've been maybe even put in the therapy because this is the danger, you see, of virtual autism is that it's being labeled, misdiagnosed as true autism. And true autism assumes that a child cannot do all those things that I was talking about that they can do, all those abilities. They can't initiate communication. They can't be social with people. They can't respond when other people show them that something is more fun and choose it instead. They can't. 
They because they are so stuck in their own internal processing and problem solving that they can't interact with other people and they need a more highly structured way to communicate. But the vast majority, I'm going to say more than 90 percent, more than 90 percent now that it's a spectrum diagnosis are being diagnosed with true autism spectrum disorder for a plethora of reasons, maybe even on your request, on the request of a doctor, on the request of a therapist, on the request of an insurance company, on the request of somebody else, you got that diagnosis. But now you know that, in fact, I just heard Stephen Camarada say it on a video I was watching this morning, misdiagnosing autism and giving the child ABA therapy, even if they're mild autism, virtual autism, even I don't think it's appropriate for any of these kids on the spectrum at all, especially if they are not, if they are able to do these things, if they are able to engage and listen and learn, you need to teach them to talk. These ABA things, they take away speech and they put in other device-based things that these tech addicted kids learn very quickly. They learn how, oh, you're going to give me a tablet to communicate with? Brilliant. Now I never have to learn to talk. And they go down a really deep rabbit hole. And nearly every child with autism spectrum who's at school age is being given these devices. It's like giving an alcoholic a bottle of booze. It's like giving a person who's addicted to smoking more cigarettes right? You're just encouraging them to go into their addiction and stay in their addicted comfort zones instead of helping them move out of it. And when you do this, the problem gets worse. The problem gets bigger. The problem gets stronger. And that's why parents struggle with all of those symptoms that are happening, that the kids are refusing and ignoring and becoming anxious. And if you are Diagnosing a child on the autism spectrum, it's like diagnosing people with insulin, type 1 or type or type 2 diabetes that are even pre-diabetes, right? These people don't need insulin. In fact, if you give them insulin, you could kill them, okay? Because of, yeah, he's more severe than we think just based on symptoms, on behaviors, I mean, thank goodness for insulin, there's an actual blood test. You can get to see the blood sugar. But let's use another analogy. Let's use depression, mental health problems. There's a whole spectrum of depression. People can be depressed when you, you know, you get ripped off at the grocery store or you lose your favorite Thing, or somebody dies, <clears throat> you know, there's there's things that trigger real bouts of depression, real feelings and real symptoms that make you depressed. You stop eating, you isolate, you, you know, think about how depression is. All of you parents and caregivers of people who are worried and frustrated and anxious about this late talker's lack of development, their delay in development, You all have a form of depression. If we gave every single one of you hardcore medicine like lithium or Prozac or something like that and made you take it against your will every single day and it turned you into a zombie because somebody misdiagnosed you with the wrong kind of depression or mental health illness because of the symptoms that you display. Because you are isolating, you are, and especially if you're in depression and you exaggerate those symptoms. Yeah, if it, it feels like you've been depressed for a year, but it's really only been a month, right? And you tell, yeah, I don't remember the last time I felt good, even though it was only six weeks ago, okay? Your child is in the middle of people telling them. They hear what people are saying about who they are and what they have and who you are and why you cause it. And you could be feeling a lot of guilt and shame and worry and fear and depression around your child's diagnosis, whatever they got. But the reality is, just like that first slide said, 
not it's not just pediatricians, but a lot of us out here in the world who have seen thousands and thousands of children and who are experts in development. We see how this tech time is destroying development, but it's nothing compared to the increase, the super amount, the over referral for applied behavior analysis with these children who do not have this diagnosis, right? That is more damaging to a child than giving them screens all day long. Because this ABA therapy, the verbal behavior approaches, the pecs, the sign language, the picture exchanges, the all of that stuff, it your child's brain needs to develop spoken language processes. And these other things develop different things. Visual learning, memorization, vocabulary building, nonverbal imitation. All of those skills are being developed in the ABA, but none of it is speech related. And the longer you wait to stop doing those pressurizing prompted speech activities and continue to allow a child to watch tech, they will decrease, 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 decrease. decrease. They will choose to decrease their time with all humans, especially if you are doing speechy stuff at home. If you're putting things out of reach, if you're making your child say a word before you give them their object, if you're making a child ask you with words for the phone before you give them the phone, it's that simple that you are contributing to the problem, not just by giving the child the phone, but by making them, prompting them to say words to get it because they're completely unteaching the natural neurological processes that are natural spoken development necessary. You've got to have these things. If you delay by putting your child in there, you delay by, oh, maybe we'll just give him this supplement for a couple months and see if it works. Maybe we'll change his diet for a little while and see if it works. Maybe we'll get the ears checked in for a couple months and see if it works. Without training, spoken language training, your child may catch up they may learn to say some words, but they're not going to catch up to their peers if they have had ABA therapy. They're not. They're not going to catch up without you showing them the right way to learn spoken language because it has been untrained. They've been trained to be passive and wait to be prompted to perform in exchange for video time in a lot of kids cases because that's what they're hooked on okay so i hope that you guys understand now a little bit more about virtual autism and what happens aisha says exactly they do understand and hear everything that we repeat about them in front of them oh of course when they you literally think about this your personal experience about this situation every mom and caregiver watching this think about your own personal experience when you were in the room with that person who was evaluating your child and your child was there they were listening they heard you ask questions and talk about their abilities and you be shut down. They heard you talk about your worry and fear about their future, that you don't know what to do, that you're, you're out, their behaviors are out of control. They hear you and understand you. And when you say things like that and you have these conversations with these people, over and over and over again, or you spend time Googling about these symptoms and what could be causing these symptoms. And, you know, if, okay, it's virtual autism now, what do I do? And then you wipe that phone away and you start prompting your child again to start talking. It's not going to fix this problem. It's not going to fix it because they hear everything. They hear the negative, but they also hear the positive. So think about this. When you say things like, wow, I know 
that you are understanding everything I say and you're trying to manipulate me to get more phone time. Guess what? Today, I have a better idea. Today, instead of watching your favorite cooking show, we're going to make those cookies. Today, instead of watching Coco Melon, we're going to do what Coco Melon's doing. We're going to count. We're going to run outside. We're going to go and play. We're going to play in water. We're going to do these things. Guess what? I've got a new idea. And then you'll see that tablet be put down more and more and more because not only do lay talkers understand everything that you are telling them, they will respond when they hear something good, just like they will respond when they hear something they don't like. They hear something they don't like, what happens? Zoom. At least they look away from you. At most, they run away from you, okay? And if they like it, at least they'll look at you. And at most, they'll stay by you and ask you to do it again and again and again and again. What kind of spoken language are you showing them? What are you demonstrating? Are you reflecting the mindset of a facilitator who believes this child can actually make more improvement or... Are you just talking about their disability, how late they are, how worried you are, how depressed you are, how much they are wrecking your house or how exhausted you are? What are they hearing you say? Okay, because remember, these kids are not autistic. They're not. They look autistic, especially to someone who's unfamiliar. But you can do this test to see if your child will turn around with the right kind of face-to-face connection. That's the trick here. It's not just any, can't just be any face-to-face connection. If you've tried and failed with face-to-face connection, you need to listen to what Aisha says here and remember that they do understand and hear everything. So if you're trying to manipulate them or prompt them into doing something because you want to see it happen, it's going to make you feel better when they start talking or doing something on their own. You're going to struggle. You're going to struggle. Okay. I do have a question today that came in from a YouTube member. Where is it? Here it is. So this member says, my six-year-old late talker does not respond immediately to instructions given by people other than his mother, who is the primary language facilitator. So the mom is doing a great job. But if someone gives him a command, he will not respond. But if his mother says it, he will immediately react and respond. Because of this, he's not able to build and connect in class and group activities. Also, he's not hyperactive. But at times, he keeps running and jumping around, which makes him look silly or funny. Do we need some sort of occupational therapy for him? So... Remember, if you are a member in the intention level of my YouTube, then your questions get highlighted and we can respond to them. And in this case, we're talking about a child that is not so much hooked on technology, but this parent really proved to this late talker that she will reach into his world offer him good things to listen to, and consistently show up with valuable experiences. That's why every time she ju- she says his name, he shows up. Because she consistently has proven to him that she's willing to reach into his world and connect with him. If you see a situation like this where Your child is not responding to other people, but only responding. We have to think about who those other people are, what they are initiating with the child. Like, what do they expect of this child? And have they proven, have they demonstrated up front to prove to the child that they will actually reach into their world and give them more valuable stuff? Or have they heard this person over and over and over again talking about their disability, what they can't do, complaining about them, all those other things? Because even if that stuff happened in the past and your late talker is doing better and better at home now, but they're not performing at school, 
They haven't earned that teacher, aide, therapist, friend, neighbor, anybody else who your child is not responding to. They haven't proven their value. And so this late talker knows clearly the difference between a valuable communication interactive experience and one where somebody's trying to make them do something, maybe against their will, that they don't want to do in the first place. Okay? They know. And so you need to see if you're sending your child repeatedly to experiences where you're setting them up to fail. You're putting them in places that are not interesting, that are too high pressure, that they are not prepared for. It's your job as a parent to prepare that child. And so you can you, you can view videos like the videos in the playlists that I have for school readiness. There's a whole playlist for members with access to multiple videos that you can see school readiness. There's also a social interaction playlist where you can watch multiple videos to learn about how helping a child become more socially interactive with people in the community, how to have play dates, how to train a child to see the value in people versus automatically be anxious. Because remember, this child, like many others, probably had the experience with familiar adults or friends who were playing, aka therapists and teachers who were not nice. They weren't, they didn't, weren't nice experiences for the child. So they want something different. And so do they need occupational therapy because he keeps running around with makes, makes, makes him look funny and silly? Who thinks he makes it makes him look funny and silly? If you as a parent are judging this child's behavior, just like those people who misdiagnose kids, this is what you're doing. You're misdiagnosing your child. You listen to somebody else who misdiagnosed your child. Maybe it's a sensory integration and maybe he needs OT. I don't think that a child who has learned, see, here's the thing. When you look at this counterintuitive message here, this person will immediately react and respond to his mother. I guarantee that when they first started spoken language facilitation, this child didn't do that, right? That wasn't happening on day one of your language facilitation journey. And you did something, maybe you worked with the workbook, maybe you've been working with the strategies, maybe you took the swapping the prompting challenge, you know, as a member in the YouTube channel, there's 600 videos for you to choose from. You've been learning, you've been working, this child is improving. And now you want to take that out into the world. So you need to dig into the videos that work on those aspects and that there are multiple strategies for you to learn how to help your child. But the first is to really evaluate this environment and choose to take a break. Even if you think your child wants to go or needs to go to a regular school environment, they're not going to be successful if you stick them in special ed and they keep them dumbing them down in special ed. And they're not going to be successful if you throw them in without being ready. You might need to pull them out. You might need to hire a language facilitation practitioner, a nanny who's trained in maybe my, one of my workshop trainings or something like that to help you learn how to facilitate spoken language at home so you can get to the point where these YouTube videos are helping you, no problem, okay? A membership will get you access to all of that information. The workbook goes through the whole process. There's ways for you to learn. And I also know that parents want an interactive experience with me. That's what I've learned. And this is why the new workshops are coming out. So the first online workshop, it's only gonna be available to 50 people and the registration is going to open on March 13th. But the actual event is Sunday, March 26th from 12 noon to 4 p.m. And so you will be able to join me for four hours to work through the process. You can work through your workbook. We're going to work through the it, just like this little self test I did on this video. You're going to analyze your own situation while we work together with video examples and me talking you through the process to figure out exactly what you need to do and make your plan to get started so that you can start to see real progress. And you don't just watch videos and spin your wheels and the book stays in the drawer and all of that stuff. So that's the most important thing about all of this. So... 
Let's see what else is going on. Oh, yes. I wanted to remind you about the in-person workshop that I have coming up. So in India, I'm going April to India. The first part of April, I'm going to be there. And the second part of April, I'm going to be in Morocco, which are not close together, but that's kind of how it works out. But in India, I'm going to be in two cities, in Vijawawa from the, on the 6th of April and Hyderabad on the 8th of April. And the day after, you can see here, it says limited personal consultation appointments will be available for those in-person workshops that I'm actually going to be showing up. After you have the half-day workshop, you'll be able to offer, I'm offering the option to meet with me personally for an hour. You can bring videos of your child, just like that whole situation. It's a lot less expensive than that online. Send me your videos and find out. We can talk about whether your child has virtual autism, if they're truly on the spectrum, if they have other physical problems that are going on. We can look at what's blocking your child's spoken language. We're going to do it in the workshop, but the opportunity to work with me individually will also be available. So. I hope you enjoyed this video. Remember, you can visit wavesofcommunication.com to access training and coaching, all kinds of training and coaching. Before you go, like this video. Everybody hit the like button. I don't say that enough on these videos because I'm more interested in training all of you, but please support this channel. There's a lot of noise out there that talks about the... Um, the problem. So, you know, Anna even says the whole system of therapy is an international fraud for taking a child's attention away from observing and imitating the speech and actions of a parent. So this is why my process talks about being easier for you than therapy, faster results, better results that you'll get. And so we say that um, the child has no longer a speech model to follow and remain untrained for speaking. And this is what we're talking about. That's what virtual autism does to a family. So Sugi says, come to Chennai. I want to come all over. So I think my next trip to India in person, I'm going to be doing, and Chennai and Tamil Nadu, I, I want to see these areas. Um, I really want to visit Kerala. I want to visit Chennai, Tamil Nadu. So I think the next time I visit, I might be, I also am, am getting feedback from people in Mumbai. They want me to visit there as well. So Bangalore as well. I could be everywhere, I think, um, around. But that's why the online option is going to be available. So this is going to be the first trip, the intro trip to India. I know that when I come, people are going to hear about it. It's going to take off and I'm going to be um, interested to come back. I need sponsors to make these travels. So if you um, are in an area, it doesn't matter if you're in India, um, you can be like the family in Morocco. They're sponsoring me to come to the area by, first of all, hosting me a place to stay. And second of all, gathering other parents, because this is really important. If we want to build this community and stop this mal malpractice and misdiagnosing and putting all these kids into these hardcore pressurized therapies, more people in the community like the people who watch my videos, need to be aware and understand and prove to yourself first that there is an alternative to these options. And when you do, then you got to start talking. You got to start talking to your neighbors. <clears throat> you got to start pushing back from these um, places that are trying to get you to come in and give your money and, <clears throat> and give your responsibility away to them and pay them. The idea is you need to learn how to do it yourself. When you get your child talking, that's the best testimonial ever. And so I want more of you to have that experience. I want more of you to share this and I want to come celebrate with you. So that's what you do. You get a group of parents together to who are interested in this. If you've got a WhatsApp group, if you've got a Facebook group, if you've got a group of parents who you think can get together, then we've got to find a place, find a, a community center or a, a ballroom somewhere or something so we can all get together and have an interactive experience and talk about it. And then again, when I show up, we'll have opportunities for people to meet with me personally and talk with me about your child. So that's the whole 
looking at Aisha's got uh, all these places that we want to go. Aisha, you seem to be very well connected. Grab a bunch of parents together and invite me over and we'll do it because I want to. I want to travel and visit all these places. And I know that this is important. I know that there are not very many options to do and I'm doing my best, but I can't be everywhere. So pay attention. If you haven't signed on to my newsletter, that's going to be really important for you to do. You can do that on the website, wavesofcommunication.com. Head over there and sign up for the newsletter, everybody. And that way, every single week, you're going to have access to the new dates where I'm traveling. You're going to have access to the new videos that I do, the new ideas that I put out, and be able to start making progress yourself. And then sharing, right? When you get that newsletter, you can share that email with your friends and other people in your community so that they also know about what's going on. There's tricks and tips in every newsletter as well as the latest videos for you to watch and the plans about future coaching. So the pr platform continues to expand both in location and in ideas and this workshop. I'm working very, very hard to put it together in a way that is compact and digestible, but not too much at too, you know, too much too fast so that you leave overwhelmed. You will leave feeling equipped and empowered after four hours only of interactive work where you're going to dig into this process that's working for parents all over the world and learn how to apply it to your family, your child, your child that you're caring for, your school, if you've got a preschool, your um, charges, if you're a nanny or caregiver, all the kids that you're working with. And you can even equip and empower their parents to see improvement. You can look better than any therapist if you connect and facilitate spoken language and show other people through your experience with the lay talker that you know, and then just talk about your experience with other people. And that's how we're going to make this a global phenomenon where everybody's going to understand the value of speech pathologists. And, and Language facilitation, even speech pathologists who are doing that prompted training can change because they are, they're learning all over the world. So thank you again for joining me, everybody. Like I said, like this video, I need to see more likes coming through and share with your friends and I'll see you on the next one. Thank you so much for joining me again. Bye for now.